J.T. Crowley is Talking Books. On this show, you'll hear from emerging talent and seasoned veterans from around the world. Hello, I'm J.T. Crowley, and I'm delighted to have on my show today, Kiki Puerta. Her full name on the books is K.L.S. Puerta, everybody. And I'm glad she's come on the show today because she's here to talk about her book, her two books, Never Saw You Coming and Now Live With That. And that's the order that they come in. So the first book, everybody, is Never Saw You Coming. And the second book is Now Live With That. So the two books, they make up this trilogy. And the third book, which is a work in progress, is going to be titled Fight to Fly. And when Kiki is going to get that out, I'll let you know. But we'll talk about that towards the end of the, uh, the podcast interview. She lives in London with her husband and two children, but she's originated from Guadeloupe in the Caribbean. Kiki is immensely proud of her French Creole ancestry and often refers to Guadeloupe as her paradise, but she equally, her paradise is at home in London as well. Kiki has long held a passion for reading and writing and language. For her, it's at the very core of what she does every day of her life. She loves romance, stories with a great deal of suspense built into them. Hence, when you look at her books, you'll see that they are romance stories, but there's an awful lot of suspense and thriller adventure in them, everybody. I've read them, believe you me. Vicky loves teaching to middle-class or high school uh, students. She teaches French and Spanish. Her educational background was through the Sorbonne Nouveau University in Paris. She loves that city. And she also um, finished off her teacher training um, program, her education for that at Oxford University. So everybody, we've got a real academic on the program today. I better watch my P's and Q's. <laughs> so let's invite Kiki onto the show. And we won't mention about black horned bulls mm. or mad cows. And if you want to know what I'm referring to there, well, go and have a look at the written introduction and you'll see the quirky story how that has come about. Kiki, yes. come and join me on the show. Hello, John. How are you? I'm good. Wonderful. And as they says, they can read all about the quirky story on the introduction, can't they? Uh, yes. Hmm. <laughs> and Kiki, everybody has lots of quirky stories, but we thought we'd ch would stick with that one. But there you go. So, Kiki, yes. first thing that strikes me about your books is that um, you must read them in sequence, everybody. For reading the second book, Now Live With That, won't make sense. So, Kiki, let's turn to the first book, Never Saw You Coming. And boy, is that title aptly given, for Beatrice definitely didn't see that side of Edward coming. Kiki, let's head directly to the section, How Did I Get There? Yes. Why did you kickstart the book off like this? You talk about um, Sister Anne's College in Cambridge, uh, the Sorbonne in Paris, Reluctant Pupils in High School, which Beatrice teaches. Red Knickers, everyone. <laughs> <laughs> A summer trip to New York. The meltdown of Beatrice's relationship with Nicholas, a previous ex-lover. This is you, isn't it? Setting the scene with, you know, quirky bits and really setting the scene of how you created your book. And of course, it is St. Anne's College in Cambridge. Tell us why you started off with, how did I get there? Well, just like the question, I had to set the scenes for my readers so that they understand the complexity of Beatrice's character. So she is ambitious, she's educated, she is bright, she's deadly romantic as well so 
I had to give um, little, how do we call it? Little teasers in the introduction. How do I get there? So that you can, as the reader, you can get attached to Beatrice very easily because she is very likable. You have to agree with me, John, don't you? Oh, she is. She, um, she's, she's a bit naive as well. She is so naive. I mean, like many young women, she is in her mid twenties. She's maybe 24, 25 in the stories. And she's dreaming about Prince Charming. You know, as a little girl, she would have been taught stories about Prince Charming. And so she, she grows up with this ideal man in her head and every relationship to her is a potential ideal man. Well, it doesn't mean that she's an easy girl, but yes, she can be flirtatious because she's looking for love. This is um, one of the main things in her life, but she is naive, as you said, but also she's very confident and fragile at the same time. She's quite complex. And as I was rereading, you know, preparing the interview, I just thought, oh my gosh, yes, there is this, there is that, and so on. And I had to set the scene to engage the readers to fall in love with Beatrice right from the first page. Did you fall in love with Beatrice? Totally. I adore her. I would do anything for her. And in book three, um, Fight to Fly, I have to give her a good ending because she has gone through so much. I won't we'll say talk more. about that later. Yes, yes, yes. Kiki, let's go to the first chapter in the book. Yeah. Um, you head that up as the happy years. This mm. is a chunky book. This is a chunky chapter, everybody. Um, straight away, you introduce us to Edward. Um, he's a Jekyll and Hyde character, everybody. As he slowly seduces her, and we're at the start of the school term, September 93. He's helping Beatrice with her Afro-American literature thesis. The ex-boyfriend, Nicholas, is ex, he's gone. And so in comes Edward. And when I first looked at Edward, he comes across as arrogant. He comes across as extremely clever. He's charming. He's witty. Um, but is this the man that Angela, or her friend who read the card, says, this is going to be the man that's going to come into your life, your Prince Charming? They have a wonderful uh, courtship and they move in together. But at the end of this long protracted chapter, you start to see the signs, the hints that things are falling apart and this relationship isn't going according to plan. Is it, Kiki? Tell us. No, it's a big ironical title, The Happy Years. I mean, basically, Edred, he is very clever. And the thing with Beatrice is that she's attracted by clever guys and she completely falls for him. He says the word, when I was doing my PhD, she doesn't hear about the title of the PhD or the fact that maybe he didn't succeed in his PhD. All she remembers is that he is PhD level. And so her friend who had read the cards to her predicted that she was going to meet this guy who is extremely hardworking and very clever. So Beatrice just puts two and two together and she decides this is him. So of course she lets herself being seduced by him and he's very bright. So he works out very quickly what she needs and he presents to her what she needs. He will write poems, he will leave little notes, all the little, um, you know, all the ticks that you have on a girl's ideal man's list. He's got to have this, he's got to have that. He, he does this, he fulfills it. So she falls under his spell and she loves her friend Angela, who's been reading cards for her. And she just wants him to be that man who is meant to arrive into her life. So he ticks all the boxes so much that he proposes to her. She accepts because he ticks all the boxes. They move in together. And as you said, 
things start to deteriorate because now that Edward has his prey in his cage, then he can let his true side come out. And he comes out as what Beatrice calls Dr. Jekyll and Hyde because he's very manipulative. He becomes an abusive partner, not physically abusive, but emotional, emotionally abusive. Yeah, phys physically, there, there are some instances later, I won't say we'll too much. We'll go there later. Oh. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and being very manipulative, so their relationship goes like this, ups and down, ups and down, ups and down, tension, recover, tension, recover. It's very tiring, mm. poor girl. And oh, I think the tension in your books is palpable. They are absolutely real page turners. You know, the tension is there all the time, all the time. It's there in your face, tension, tension. And as you said, never mind up and down. I think it's more like crash and wallop at times. <laughs> <laughs> Basically, take me to paradise, but take me to hell the next time and take me back to paradise and we'll do another trip oh, to yeah. hell and so on. This, these characters do this, everybody. Um, so let's um, move on to chapter two. Yes. Uh, first touch with evil. Ooh, here we go, everyone. <laughs> this is an interesting chapter, and I can't but feel that you're starting to ratchet up the tension here. Beatrice comes home from watching a film, The Last Temptation of Christ, to find Edward, now her husband, in an uncompromising position. And you introduce us to Ariana Manuel. Mm. Mm -mm -mm. This is where the trouble comes in, everybody. Now, this character is a 17-year-old student of his, who I think is quite a manipulative little so-and-so. Not so naive for her youthful years, so to speak, or is she? What's going on here, Kiki? Well, this chapter, which I call First Touch with Evil, basically to contrast from the happy years, um, is when she discovers the worst possible thing that any woman can find out, that your husband is having an affair. But it is even worse than just an affair. It is an affair with his students. He's not meant to do that. It's against the law. And so this first touch with evil is a total crisis because Beatrice, she had had some red flags that she ignored because Edward was a perfect man. But that is too big to be ignored. So her blood boils in her veins and she just loses it. She loses her trust. She loses her self-esteem. She confronts Edward. I mean, the relationship is at that stage. It's a real turning point into catastrophe land and it's just going to become worse and worse and harder and harder for Beatrice to to recover it's really first touch with evil um proper Mr Hyde in action there so yes a lot of tension and I'm glad that you felt it it was meant to be felt <laughs> oh it's definitely there Mm -hmm. um, now, you like chapter six. It's a short chapter, everybody. Mm. So this chapter is headed up, Love Me So Dearly, Down to Hell. Why this chapter? Well, Edward loves Beatrice so much, but what he has done in his troubled mind is just so awful. So because I love you so much, I can't cope with what I have done. I really can't, and I don't want to live anymore. And, and that is the biggest thing that she could be dealing with. Well, not the biggest, if I'm thinking about the other books. It's enormous. Um, waking up after having kicked out her husband from home because it's one incident after the other, not just the email, but letters that she discovers. She becomes like a Sherlock Holmes, <laughs> sussing and checking out on her husband because the trust is gone. So she has to verify everything that comes 
in her hands. And she kicks him out. And the next morning, um, the police is at her front door to say they have, they have found him. So the crisis of discovering the affair turns into something even more morbid because he'll have to fight for his life. So it's love me so dearly, but I love you so dearly that I can't cope with it and I don't want to live anymore without you. Mm. Let's, um, there's 26 chapters in this book, everybody. So let's go to uh, chapter 25. They came, that's the title of the chapter. Um, and they being the police, of course. They've come to the school to take her away, search the house, and then take her to the police station for questioning. This is an important chapter for it's the opening gambit to the start of the next book. Tell us about this chapter. You tease <laughs> here with the police. So you have lovely Beatrice. She's lovely. Her husband is in hospital. And what, what he did provoked Beatrice to behave in a way that she should not have behaved. And she gets in touch with Ariana, but she gets too much in touch with Ariana, so much that Ariana got scared and went to the police. And the police came and they arrest Beatrice. So we go from the start of the book, the happy years, this wonderful woman, starting her career as an Italian and French teacher, and she ends that book arrested by the police. How more shocking could it get? Wait till you get to the second book, everyone. <laughs> <laughs> I know, I know. Basically, John, when I finish that chapter, that's when I, you know, you, you close your laptop. Yes, I'm going to end here. And, and what do you end the chapter, what do you end the book with? Those words? I didn't see you coming, Edward. Exactly. And I thought, yeah, she, they didn't see that coming. She didn't see this. He didn't see that, 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 that. Never saw you coming. And that's how the title of the book was Absolutely. born. Right at the end. Let's go to the second book. Yes. In this trilogy. Now live with that. Oh boy. Now live with that. Yeah. And I make it very clear that there's no point reading this second book first without reading the first book, because you simply want to understand the story, everybody. So you do need to read the books in sequel. Now, the big chapter at the start of this book with a lot of meaty substance into is chapter two, The Hidden Truth. It's the chapter, Kiki, you've given over to the police interview at the station, where Beatrice has found herself, and, her, and so has Edward. Um, but this is Beatrice's interview more than Edward's. And I must say, like both books, the storyline here has, is palpable, is so tense, and it's beautifully written. I know what's in this chapter, but can you tell the listeners, the viewers, what is going on here? What is this? Oh, Beatrice, she is arrested. She's taken to the police station, Crawley police station. And um, she's interrogated by DC mayors and by child protection officer. And in her mind, everybody's nice. When they meet people, when she meets people, so she first she first thinks that the police officers are okay. The DC mayor looks quite fatherly, and he seems to be on her side. In her head, she is the victim of this whole story. But as the interrogation progresses, then the two officers they shift in the sense that they from the start never so. Beatrice as a victim, but they manipulated her so that she could feel at ease to tell her story. So she tells her story and then they ask her questions to make her repeat. 
and she's getting confused. She's getting tense. She's having heart palpitation because this is too much on her nervous system. And at the end of that interview, she, she accepts a caution because she went into mother protection mode and her solicitor, he was completely rubbish. He was meant to be there to defend her, but she did all the talking. So, and he gave her that advice and she accepted it because in her mind, the only thing that mattered at that stage was her children and not to have a too big an impact on her children. She accepted to sign a caution paper, but that interrogation is just, awful she is just destroyed she is just crushed and she acted the way that she did because she was trying to save her marriage but she just went the wrong way about it and you know when you love someone you could do anything to save mm -hmm. the person and she just lost herself in what was right to do what was not right to do and the consequences are humongous. And it's all because of Edward. Had he not done all this horrible stuff, had he not touched evil, she would have never been in that situation because she was just happy, lurry, naive Beatrice teaching her lessons. Love is blind, isn't it? Completely blind. And of course, this caution gets mm. her into trouble, more trouble. You've we'll been stop there for that one. Yes. Then you have to find out, everybody, how <laughs> that pans out. And we're not going to tell you yet. Good. Piki, in our previous chats before coming on the show, you wanted to talk about chapter 18 in this book, about um, to cross the line. Mm. It's a short but poignant chapter. So very briefly, tell us why you want to cover this particular chapter off here. Because I have given you so much tension, I have to give you something good for Beatrice. So her love story with Edward, I see it as an impossible love story, okay? But then Beatrice, if you remember the beginning when I said she's very flirtatious and she's looking for true love, she's going to have a little bit of this in this colleague who started at her school called Lawrence. Oh yes, Lawrence. <laughs> and this chapter 18 is about setting the scene of another attraction for Beatrice. So she's attracted to Lawrence. She's so attracted to him like from day one. She could not even look at him in the eyes because he's tall. He's black, he's gorgeous, he is bright. We know she likes clever men. And she can't even look at him because he's having some sort of tingling effect on her. And is Lawrence attracted by Beatrice? You have to find out. And that's why I wanted to mention this chapter 18, which is about, which is called About to Cross the Line. Um, yeah, because the next few chapters um, are all about crossing the line, you know, basically about to cross the line, crossing the line and gone over the line, basically. <laughs> they're the next, the 18, 19, 20. That's how they're headed up, everybody. But I want to go take you, uh, Kiki, on to um, chapter 23 in this second book, because this is an interesting chapter, Plans in Motion. Wait for this one, everybody. This is Edward. <laughs> Planning, absolutely. <laughs> Planning for what? Uh, what's about to happen at the end of the book? Did you, in a, a sort of macabre um, sort of way, enjoy writing this chapter? Oh, my goodness, yes. <laughs> <laughs> I had so much fun with this chapter. Um, because Edward... We can't forget him. Yes, she's getting a little bit of happiness with Lawrence in the background, but Edward, Edward is really mean. And he's not happy about how the story um, ended in book one. So it's, you know, it's, it's this lover who is hurt and 
kind of wants revenge. So he's planning things, but I'm not telling you what he's planning because I want you to feel like, oh, what is going to happen here? There is something bad <laughs> because nothing that Edward does is good, you know, apart from really early, early in book one. Nothing that he does is good. His courtship was good, but that's it. So he is working out something Machiavellian about the story. He's got to have his revenge. I'm not telling you how, I'm just telling you he's planning it. And you have to think, what is he planning? Is it against Beatrice? Is it against the children? Is it against Lawrence? Is it against the school? What is he planning? I don't want to tell you, I want you to read more. And there is a surprise at the end, everyone. <laughs> Let's go to uh, chapter 27, Golden Journey. Yes. Because this is the journey to Paris, organised by Lawrence, Beatrice's a new lover, and it's about her birthday. But, of course, you put us in Paris because you love Paris. You, you know, went to the Sorbonne uh, Nouveau University there, so Paris is a place that you know so well. So I wasn't surprised that you put the character there for a weekend trip to um a hotel in Paris and see all the scenes there. Tell us a little bit about Golden Journey. Mm. The Golden Journey, I, I wanted to, to have something beautiful, something magical, to give this sort of really special time to Beatrice and Lawrence. So they're going to Paris and the Golden Journey is literally the feel is what they see and they see Paris by night for the first time together and their taxi driver he's got these two English tourists I mean he doesn't know that Beatrice is French but it doesn't matter and at the back so he just takes them to the most beautiful places in Paris as he's crossing the capital to go and take them to the hotel um, which is not very far from the Eiffel Tower. So they move from Gare du Nord to a hotel near the Eiffel Tower. And all the lights, it's the Christmas period. So you have beautiful decorations everywhere. They, they pass in front of um, the big department store on the Boulevard Haussmann. And then they pass by the British um, Council. And all these places, Beatrice knows because she has studied in Paris. She is from Paris. So it's a really romantic, magical time for her and Lawrence as they come out of Gardinor going towards the hotel. And I just and I just loved it because I just put the best bits of Paris that I know into the chapter. You know, I think I think you quite fancy Lawrence. <laughs> <laughs> probably, probably. I think she does, everyone. I think she fancies Lawrence. That's why she created the character like that. This, well, yeah, this Lawrence was created to be nothing but amazing. Amazing and sexy and clever. And, you know, yes, I probably fancy Lawrence. I wish she was real. <laughs> oh, dear. <laughs> Let's go to chapter 30. La Vie oh, on Rose. Yes. Uh, this is quite a sensual chapter. The sex scene in Paris before the unforeseen twist in the next and last chapter. Did you enjoy writing this chapter? I yes. think you did. I did, I did. Can I tell you how that chapter came about? Well, I'm hoping you are. <laughs> okay. I had a dream. In that dream, I was attending a writing class. Okay. And in that writing class, the lecturer, was saying to the class, you have 30 minutes to write a love scene based on the song La Vie en Rose by Edith Piaf. But it was an English class, so he played La Vie en Rose sang by Louis Armstrong. And in my dream, this is what I was doing. I was listening to the song and writing a love scene from it. And I woke up, and I still remembered my dream. And I thought, oh my God, oh my God, I've got to do this. I've got to do that. So I literally wrote that chapter listening to Louis Armstrong. And that's why it's so sensual and beautiful and amazing. 
and yes it's it's about it's about sex it's a sexy scene but i didn't want to it to be raunchy or you know I, I won't mention any other sexy books but i wanted the reader to be able to imagine and feel the scene with the soundtrack of louis armstrong singing um and then lawrence sings to beatrice it's just the most beautiful thing ever <laughs> the whole idea when you write a, a scene like that you don't go you don't need to go into graphics you just you need to tantalize the reader and the listener yes. so they can form their own imagination you know go off in their own little world yes yeah, so i think i put just the bare minimum you got it right you got it right Is it? oh thank you thank you okay <laughs> kiki yes you gave us a hint here there's a third book so what's next for you in terms of your writing and yourself i know there's a third book in the making fight to fly can you give us a brief insight as to what's coming in that little book um well the end of book two is a tragic end but i am not telling you how tragic it is we're keeping that a secret everyone exactly so I'm leaving you at the end of book two with another shock. I'm sorry, I love shocking the readers. <laughs> it's about yin and yang, you know, it's a balance of life. Good and bad, good and bad, good and bad. That, that's how I write. And of course, so, the last few words in that chapter, the end chapter are now live with that. Yes, and it's quite threatening, isn't it? Oh, it is. Oh, la la. Yes, so book three, you have what happens after the threat is thrown now live with that and you have beatrice again taken by the police but this time it goes much deeper the trouble just goes whoosh like this i mean the poor girl she'll be taken with handcuffs away from the scene and you have the other characters in a really tragic situation. Um, questions, are they going to live? Are they going to die? What's going to happen to Beatrice? She's going to be locked up, but she's a teacher. She's a good person. So maybe she will find ways to come out of her trouble and, and be happy and fly away, literally flying after fighting flying metaphorically literally flying but you have in the title fight to fly the essence of what i believe that life is about lots of struggles but there is always light at the end of the tunnel and i have to give beatrice some light and love but there'll be some big fights before she gets to that okay Hickey, who yes. do you see as your markets uh, for your books and more importantly who would you like to see reading your books um you describe as romantic thrillers they're set in london paris martinique in the french caribbean who do you want to read your books i think young women will relate with my book very well, especially the ones who are in their mid twenties, up to 55 plus. So it's a book that will talk deeply, I think to women and men also, the men who have read it, have enjoyed it. And the men who read it, I would say that if you recognize yourself, of having some traits like Edward, you need to do some work <laughs> on yourself because carrying on a life with spreading red flags is not good. So ladies, I, I say my young sisters will enjoy reading the book, especially 25 to 55 plus. Okay. And the guys will also enjoy reading it to see the other side of the story the the other side when the man is just over powerful and how it can be destructive where can people get your book from kiki 
Okay, the book is on Amazon. The books are plural. I wrote two books. <laughs> the books are on Amazon. They're on Barnes and Nobles, and uh, these are the main, the biggest. So yeah, you can find okay. them there. Mm -hmm. There you go, everyone. That is Kiki Vatura with her two books. Um, and I just want to say it's been a great pleasure interviewing you, chatting to you over the last few weeks, finding out all about your books. It's been a sheer pleasure and joy. Thank you very much. Likewise, John. Thank you. Kiki Futura, everybody. I'm JT Crowley. Thanks for listening, watching, wherever you are in the world. So until next time, stay safe.